Back in 2020, I covered my favorite arena shooter for a dead game review. A game which got a lot of love from fans, but was eventually left behind by the studio that developed it. Unreal Tournament 4 was far from a popular game. It wasn't even that widely advertised as it was unfinished and in continued development. Which meant that for many, the new entry to the Unreal Tournament series was hidden in plain sight. I was lucky to have found Unreal Tournament 4 in 2015, and I made sure to keep track of the project over the years to come, even after it was left for dead, when that other game Epic developed received its Battle Royale mode. I was rest assured, Unreal was not going anywhere. If I ever wanted to play, it would always be there on the Epic Game Store, ready to download. The newest and least finished Unreal Tournament of them all also was a formal introduction into the franchise for me. Even though the computer was the main platform of choice since I was a 7-year-old child back in 2006, multiple roadblocks prevented me from ever experiencing the franchise. For one, the series was banned for purchase in Germany, and my parents would never have bought the game for me, as they took an interest in what media I consumed, something that I was annoyed about back then, but which I am certainly grateful for in retrospect. Second, our family computer wasn't the best, and I doubt it could have run some of the newer entries into the series. And finally, I was a far less computer-savvy person at the time, with torrenting and game cracking and basic PC-related troubleshooting being foreign concepts to me. Skills which I picked up slowly over time. For many other players, like for instance for our guest today, the introduction came at a much earlier point in time. My name is Jeremy, my online name is Fantasy. I've gone as some variant of Fantasy, whether it's with a C or an S, it's spelled P-H-A-N. You know, it's up to creativity. So I started as Fantasy on PlayStation 3 on console. Uh, so I played that for, what, man, as long as I could. Uh, I want to say, you know, it came out late 2007, and then I kind of played that until around 2012-ish, 2013. But uh, yeah, I've been playing UT since 2007. Unreal came into my life very early. I was, it was um, the year 1999, so I was 12 years old. And I have actually played this game consistently in its various renditions all the way to present time. So over 20 years. So I started playing uh, Unreal Tournament. My, and, and, uh, someone's gonna knock on my dad's door at this, but uh, he was a big, he got into PC gaming right at the, the kickoff of it, you know, the mid-90s playing Quake and Quake 2. So he played a lot of online Quake 2, he played some Quake 3, and then he eventually got his hands on uh, like a Voodoo card, the old accelerator card, and that gave him the ability to play Unreal, and he played Bot Match, and then he picked up Unreal Tournament. So he was playing that, and of course, like, uh, he, he loved it and enjoyed it. He got into the map-making tools, and... He had that as a, as a creative outlet, and I was watching him do this. Um, and, you know, like any, anyone would, he wanted to share that passion. So he, uh, you know, I was interested in, in learning how to do it, and he was interested in showing me. So he sat me down as a, I don't even know how old I would have been. <clears throat> young. We'll go with young. Maybe 10, 9. After having played Unreal Tournament 4 almost eight years ago, I explored other titles in the series, playing some of the campaign of Unreal Gold, deathmatching in Unreal Tournament 99 and 2004, and Unreal Tournament 3, with clear preferences forming and the latest iteration of the series emerging as my favorite. As someone who did previously immerse himself into competitive Quake-like shooters, with Team Fortress 2 having been my first long-term comfort game and later on playing various classic Doom and Quake titles, Exploring the established Rival series was an eye-opener for me, not only when it comes to the differences in gameplay mechanics, but also through exploring the wider impact Unreal and its engine has brought forth in partaking in the hobby. From legendary maps, music, and even something as simple as announcer packs finding their way into different games. Similar to how its software brought out the best in aspiring game developers, Epic Mega Games was a pivotal company in the game development scene, with many older Unreal Engine titles coming bundled with an editor and files being left accessible for the up-and-coming modder to have a crack at making their own ideas come to fruition. 
while also allowing other players to experience these creations from the most talented and dedicated in their community. Unreal and Quake showed early on how important a modding scene can be for a game's longevity and cultural impact. As decades after the first games in the series came out, they are still cherished and frequently played by fans, with Quake even being ported to newer consoles and both franchises enjoying a somewhat splintered but nonetheless dedicated community of players, eager to improve and get better in the games they adore so much or to experience casual fun with arranged bot matches and the latest mods and maps one downloaded. Unbeknownst to players at the time, the legacy of Unreal Tournament would be put to the ultimate test by none other than Epic Games themselves. On January 24th, 2023, all Unreal games were pulled off digital storefronts, with only Unreal Tournament 3 being granted a re-release sometime in the future. But we still do not know of an exact release date yet. Initially, the only news anyone heard of related to a Steam Store page which Wario64 uncovered on Twitter, which was generally regarded as positive news in the community, even though Unreal Tournament 3 is somewhat of a black sheep in the franchise. I was quite enthusiastic about the news too, as someone who likes to explore the more inactive side of multiplayer gaming. I thought this was excellent news. A big game company revitalizing an older game to give that title another shot and garnering a newer player base is a great idea. And if any company can gamble, it certainly is Epic Games. But my celebration was short-lived, as soon after a bombshell was dropped on us. and you know what it is. Not only was Epic planning to turn off all the master servers from past Unreal Tournament games, but to add insult to injury, all games would be taken off the Steam store. Which means that there is no legitimate way to play these titles anymore. Except if one contends on buying a second-hand copy of one of the games on a physical disc, or opts to buying a key. At this rate it is safe to say that one should just download the games for free at this rate as Epic Games aren't interested in selling Unreal games anytime soon. Epic's choice for the unlisting is baffling to, to What many people say, and which I mostly agree with, is that it is rather disappointing that Epic Games treats the franchise that put them on the map with such disrespect. But what also is clear and understandable is that Epic Games aren't a charity, and they may do with their properties what they want. So if they want to shut down all the servers and essentially kill their own games, they technically can. I think they'll continue to exist. I think though, like I said in my video, it will be harder and harder to discover the series. And I did get some comments that I thought were, were interesting but unhelpful in that people were like, anyone who would discover it has discovered it. You know, don't worry about discovery. Everybody knows about it. I don't think that's the case. Like I said, you know, with my Command & Conquer example, lots of people, lots of younger people discover, you know, I, I, I liken it to this. You got someone who was born in like 2010, you know, and they discovered Led Zeppelin and like, you know, hard rock from like the the the, the 60s and 70s, like they're, and they like it and they, they want to go find it and they want to go listen to it, you know? It's the same thing in games, right? Uh, you know, someone will discover UT-99 and go, this thing is fun, it's crazy off the walls, like, I want to continue to play this. Um, so I think discovery that way will be made much more challenging, or unfortunately all of them will be funneled into UT-3X or UTX or whatever they're, they're going with in that front. Um, um, Realistically though, Unreal Tournament is unbelievably difficult to kill especially the older titles, which were products of simpler times, and which are well documented and popular amongst modders and system admins. Many also are willing to go through heaven and hell just to play their favorite games one more time. Patches, torrent downloads, messing around in CFG files, no problem. But one game in the franchise was in dire straits. Unreal Tournament 4 was at risk of not being playable 
after the main server shut down, due to it using central servers for a multitude of functions which would need to phone home to the server and listen for a response back, it meant that those central servers needed to be reverse engineered, which normally is quite hard to accomplish. Yet key figures in the community proved soon enough that Unreal Tournament players do not give up easily. And I think that for UT4, there's uh, unique challenges. Um, I think that that game, you know, understandably, probably has the smallest footprint of them all, uh, in that it was not even a finished product, and it's the newest, right? So it has the lowest, um, lowest scale of community. So, what does Unreal look like after the master server shut down? The server browsers do not work anymore, for all the Unreal titles. Even Unreal Tournament 3, which will be getting a new server system sometime in the future, which we can only hope will preserve the previous methods of hosting and joining games. The only modes you can play are the single player campaigns and bot matches, which for many is enough to enjoy the game, but for the multiplayer fans, things do look rough. The good thing is that the crafty players figured out ways in which they could play Unreal games together again. For Unreal Tournament 2004, the community had to make use of custom master servers for a good while already. And the community of Unreal Tournament 99 finally got their own master server replacement as well. The most baffling unlistings are Unreal Gold and Unreal 2 The Awakening, both games which feature single-player components alongside the multiplayer action. Gold being considered terrific, and 2 being considered terrible. However, quality of the campaigns aside, Unreal Gold and Unreal 2 would still be worth purchasing if one wanted to experience the single-player campaigns. Nonetheless, the game in the franchise which was most worrisome was Unreal Tournament 4, as it is a game with a relatively small player base. So far, every game except Unreal Tournament 4 booted without much effort and setup required, and one could easily get into a bot match and explore the game world. Gaining access to the files also is only a few searches away, with archive.org featuring numerous downloads for various versions of prior Unreal Tournament games. Even console versions you could load onto a jailbroken PlayStation device. And not to mention, DRM-free good old games copies floated on the web as well, and you don't need to be scared off from downloading the games in this manner. Epic are not making money on those games either way, so please download to your heart's content. To focus on Unreal Tournament 4, you cannot download the game from the Epic Game Store anymore, but there are links which one could access to download the files and I will make sure to offer a mirror of my files in the description below. Once the files are unpacked, you somehow need to start the game. Follow this tutorial from Timimit on his website in order to get the game up and running. If this is your first time playing Unreal Tournament 4, you will have to create a shortcut of the game's exe first and add the line that was written down on the website into the launch commands first. Then you can start the game and already have fun with bots. To gain access to the master servers and play online, you follow the rest of the guide and create an account on Timimit's website. Even though Unreal Tournament 4 has issues and roadblocks were always present as you may have noticed after watching my previous video on the game, the game still offers things that a multitude of other experiences do not. And some of these offerings are even becoming more and more unique in the arena shooter genre itself. The gameplay itself is excellent. Although it features various alterations to the base Unreal formula, some of which have been received well while others were not that popular. Sliding and wall running added much more versatility to the movement, yet the double jump from previous games has been removed. Then some weapons were simplified. For instance, one of the more controversial choices was to split the rocket launcher into two weapons. The rocket launcher itself, which retains its secondary fire mode with the option to launch grenades removed, and the grenade launcher, which can launch sticky explosives which detonate on command, and standard grenade pills which bounce around the environment and explode on their own or on impact. Despite some more or less popular changes in gameplay here or there, the core of Unreal Tournament essentially still remained the same. Being skill-based competition on an equal playing ground with the only differentiating factor 
being the experience of each individual competitor in the ring. Even for the less experienced players like myself, the will to get better becomes infectious and the palpable progression in skill can sometimes be observed over the course of a single duel. You start using weapons you did not before. Suddenly you are surviving for minutes on end instead of only 30 to 40 seconds. You begin to land trick shots and headshots from time to time. And you may even land a kill or pick up an item before your experienced opponent gets the chance to. These small compounding victories can be observed if you stick to it and keep playing any Unreal game as a sport. Due to the way that you're on equal footing with your opponent and there's nine different weapons along with each of them having an alternate fire mode, um, and then there's the timer elements and there's all these different elements to the game, it is almost as if it's like chess, but really fast paced because no one would say, oh, chess is, is a, is a, a non-skill based game. That's just not true. Chess is very skill based and lots of uh, grandmasters work many hours to reach that ranking. Um, it's the same thing with Unreal Tournament. Being an extremely individualistic game in terms of design, it also allows a player to use every tool in their belt in order for them to develop their own style. What other game would you be able to identify a player simply by watching him play? I've actually called two or three different players out simply by their play style. Um, you know, knowing how Trinitech places his rockets, knowing how MASH moves, knowing how, uh, yeah, knowing how, I don't know, Mike the Unit aims. Like, I actually know these guys. I know where they like to play. I know how they play. So even when people alias, there's a, there's a semi-decent chance we can, we can pick it out, you know, if you have any unique elements to your game. That tells me that the different people bring a different element to the game, the different personalities can express themselves in different ways on the game. And I love that fact. Because if I go in, and again, I, I keep railing on Call of Duty, but if I log into Call of Duty, there is only one single meta. Grab an assault rifle or a sniper and just go and click. Unreal Tournament always was a breeding ground for some of the most capable combatants in esports. Similar to Quake, Unreal Tournament is a game like no other, which first and foremost incentivizes the cultivation of individual skill. Of course, many different games offer various kinds of gameplay expression and reward the progression of someone's abilities in different ways, but Unreal Tournament is special in the sense that it offers both a truly neutral playing ground and a capable sandbox for a player to explore. You're given a blank battlefield with which to paint a beautiful canvas. It is a 100% skill-based shooter. And the plays that are made on the battlefield are plays that were made not based out of a feature of the game, but out of the actions of a mind. And that's why I love Unreal Tournament. You look at that combo that, that Poe hit on us. That took someone of extreme skill to do that. And I'll tell you right now, our team was capturing that flag, except for that one Hail Mary play. The proverbial sandbox extends far beyond individualistic player expression. Instead, it is part of Unreal Tournament's identity, to the point where even different gameplay modes can become specializations for certain players. One specialization doesn't even revolve around killing other players at all. It rather centers its focus on running through a map as fast as possible. Bunny track maps are parkour courses, which require the player to master the game's movement mechanics for them to optimize their times and run through a map as fast as they can. Bunny tracks is the mode where you kind of develop your movement skills, right? And so you kind of try to create the levels as fast as possible and map makers will obviously make these jumps and these things like where you have to have like a perfect dodge or a perfect jump. While Unreal's movement may seem simple when compared to the bunny hopping and rocket jumping of Quake at first, it is worth looking into deeper, as experienced players will recognize a noob in seconds based on movement alone. Bunny track maps may be a great place to start learning the ins and outs of Unreal Tournament's movement mechanics. I think one thing that deepened this relationship between the game and the players was that the collaboration between the developers and the community was a fundamental concept for its development from day one. 
which meant that skins, weapon models, cosmetics, maps, music, anything that can be created was in large part created by the community. With a potential for digital items to be sold through a marketplace to support them. Similar to how various Valve games handle their own game monetization. The difference with Unreal Tournament 4 is that the entire game was shaped through community efforts along the way. And this was obvious when continuously playing the game or when picking it back up again after an extended break. I remember the Enforcer and Bio Rifle changing shape completely, for instance. Features being adjusted, removed, or added, and maps continuously getting polished. Then, development suddenly stopped. I think the greatest chunk of irony out of it all is uh, the fact that at the bottom corner of the login screen or any loading screen, it says uh, Unreal Tournament. You know, Alpha is a work in progress and a collaboration between Epic Games and the community. It's like, hmm, this did not age well. <laughs> hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the video so far. This channel is sponsored by myself and my benefactors. Many thanks to my supporters Dark Kitten Fire and Jenny for supporting this channel monetarily. If you want to support, you can do so by either just subscribing on YouTube and sharing my videos around, or alternatively, if you want to be a bit more involved, you could also send me donations. One-time donations can be done on PayPal, which are non-binding. You can send as much as you want or as little as you want. Then you can also donate one time by using the YouTube thanks feature, or you could subscribe by subscribing on Gumroad, Patreon, or YouTube membership. Making documentaries is expensive. It costs money and also a lot of time. If you want to support and you really want to see more documentaries like these, then please consider donating. It helps way more than ad revenue ever could. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. In 2017, Unreal Tournament 4 got its last update. And since then, the game never was officially canceled. The anxiety of a dedicated player base continuously grew. The developers who previously worked on Unreal Tournament 4 thus began work on Fortnite Battle Royale, and the game has been continuously worked on since. Epic didn't contract any studios or hired new developers for them to resume work on Unreal, so sadly the project didn't really go anywhere. Epic's developers were kept busy nonetheless, as Fortnite's live service model would require them to keep constant momentum going, with more and more character models, animations, sound, and features being added and tweaked in a steady pace continuously since 2017, which paid off, with Fortnite becoming not only a game, but a cultural phenomenon, in part at the expense of the Unreal Tournament 4 community. You know, in a, in a world with games that are free to play and microtransactions, it's all about keeping the player there and engaged with your game. You know, and Epic uh, currently with Fortnite has taken the hard way, right? You know, as someone with my finger to the pulse on on sort of stuff in the industry and, and jobs and so on. You know, they turn over developers and animators and, and uh, modelers and artists constantly because they work them to the bone, desperately trying to keep up the content train, you know, that uh, helps support that game. That's what keeps people playing it over and over and over again is that, you know, every week there's six new characters kind of thing, you know, just over and over and over and over and over again. What left Unreal Tournament 4 fans with a bad taste in their mouth also were various homage additions to other game properties, which to a wider audience of people felt like neat little callbacks, but which to a subset of the Unreal community felt like salt being rubbed into a wound. With facing world's theme foregone destruction making its way into Fortnite under the name Unreal Chill, and some of Unreal's most iconic weapons making their way into Digital Extreme's Warframe. In isolation, those additions clearly weren't intended to upset any players, in the case of Digital Extremes especially so, as the developer is just as responsible as Epic in turning Unreal Tournament into a household name. For some of the players, however, that love the most neglected entry into the Unreal Tournament series like myself, those additions felt bitter, which could have been avoided if Epic just cancelled the game in advance, instead of letting us hang in a limbo of speculation. What I said to Chicken 
which I didn't record, and he immediately was, he was like, "Thank you," because he he he, he was. He, he, I guess it was must have been profound to him or something. Yeah. But throughout you know playing this game, there's always this pipe dream uh, thought of they'll, maybe they'll come back to the game, maybe they're not. You know, it's on hiatus. Yeah. And even though the game is going to get maintained by the community, whether Epic likes it or not. The fact that they are shutting it down, it squashes that pipe dream. It confirms that it's, you know, they're never coming back to it. It does. Yeah, you know, Unreal Tournament was something that we were excited for. The community was fully on board. So that's it for this week's Top 5 Unreal Plays. If you've liked the content, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to be a part of next week's Top 5 Unreal Plays, upload your clips here. And if you'd like to play Unreal Tournament for the first time, you've never seen it before, you can click on the links below. It's completely free, so enjoy. And then to be abandoned, to be completely forgotten, was enough of a blow. It really was. Now, thanks to the amazing developers and community, we have a game that has an extensive ecosystem. We've got mutators, we've got mods, we've got various things that plug into the game that were all created by the community. Um, lots of content. And to be frank, the game would not be playable without the contributions of the community itself. Because the developers had lost touch with what Unreal Tournament was. And to be forgotten was was a, definitely a, a blow. But then to be shut down with absolutely zero notice. It, they didn't even, it was just, oh, hey, on January 24th, we're shutting everything down. It was like, it was a buy note in a social media post. Um, the community was shocked and the Epic Games did not have the common courtesy to DM the administrators of the various communities. They just simply said, hey, we're pulling the plug. That was such a devastating announcement that I, in fact, shed tears in reality because Unreal Tournament means a lot to a lot of players. And there is a sector of players that once Unreal Tournament goes away, they won't have interest in gaming and they'll be moving on to other things because there are very few games that provide the same level of immersion and content and challenge that Unreal Tournament can offer. Just fucking give up the belt at this point, Jeremy. Just fucking... Oh, that's a good rocket. Rocket himself. Good rocket. Did Jeremy get the belt? Uh, he can't. No, he didn't. He got tried rocket. I think he's gonna grab it. And that's gonna be a big decision. I thought he got it, though, when he ran seconds. by. That's gonna be a big decision. That's gonna be a big decision. That's gonna allow Fantasy to put some distance. Fantasy though doubles back around, goes down the lift. That's a smart oh, move to put that lift between be careful. him and his opponent. Doubles back up the lift. That lift right there, backing into the lift, jumping away. Could have saved his lead here. We've got seven seconds left in Snatch. Oh, no. He's out of options. All I can do is dive into him. Looking for the oh. airbox. Hits two of them. He's one no. more shot. One more shot primary. Let's, Let's go! go! Let's 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 go! let us go but mastery always feels like it's a step out there. At mastery of Unreal Tournament, there's few that can claim it, and so it has various modes, and you may be really good at flag-based modes, but then there's the cage match, the boxing ring, the one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, no teammates, no excuses, dual showdown. So that is a mode that I was introduced to uh, through some friends that played Capture the Flag. So I stepped into the arena, and you have the same stats as your opponent, and you both have the same arena before you, and the same choices, but only one man will come out ahead. 
and it's how you navigate that it's it's how you battle it's the choices you make on the battlefield it's a game of control and so through learning duel uh i went i went from you know not being a duelist at all to now being a, a decent level duelist but that has been a, a deep learning experience for me where I've had to really identify areas that I need to change and areas that I need to grow. And every loss, you have to sit down and say, because you can't blame, you know, you have to look inward and say what, you know, that opponent bested me and I've got to give them the respect. And that was due to the choices I made on the battlefield. So what can I do? And so it's, you know, put your head down, work hard, try to identify your weaknesses and then shore those up. And you're doing this all within the context of a community as well. So you have your social elements, you have your reputation, you have, oh, you beat who? And who beat you? What? You know, and so you have all this, it's like, it's kind of like um, a lion cub fighting with his brother. You know, I feel like that's what all of us do lists are. It's like, we're just out there wrestling, like always trying to jockey for first position. Um, you know, it's, and we do it for glory. I mean, there's no, we're not getting paid. You know, we do it for passion. We do it for the trophy that we get to raise high when we do happen to get a victory. It's been a journey of highs and lows though. Let me tell you, I mean, there's been times where I've been beaten so bad and so thoroughly that I have to, I hang my head and I go, do I have what it takes to pick myself back up and step back onto the arena because this man is defeating me, you know? And a lot of times you you get to see, uh, you get to dig deep and you get to see parts of yourself that you didn't know you had. I, I've been pushed to that last thread and just had to hit that one final clutch shot and, and did it, you know, right as the timer expired. And uh, there's just nothing like that. Surprisingly, Unreal Tournament 3 was considered to enter the MLG roster as yet another breeding ground for broadcasted competitions. But it is difficult to get a competitive scene going when not enough people show up to the tournament. During that time, there was someone who went by the name of Killer KC, and he used to um, he used to be like a playtester for like official MLG settings. And so around that time, Gears of War was on the MLG circuit, and they were testing out UT3 for Xbox. Uh, for 1v1 and so they had done a beta tournament if you will it was a 64 man tournament like an actual paid tournament and so that was like record breaking for ut3 at the time because you know playstation version like i mentioned was dead uh the pc version was obviously doing its own thing because mlg was like a console uh gaming organization let's just call it that and so yeah we it was a 64 man dual tournament it was like a 500 dollars prize first got 300 second got 200. Uh, since it was on Xbox, it was on uh, it was pe you know it was peer to peer. Uh, so I ended up getting second place. My teammate Paul Easy got first place, and so you know that didn't pan out because they wanted the, the tournament to to fill out to 64 players. Unfortunately, I think we got around like 20 something, uh, and so that's you know the, the dreams and hopes of UT3 going to MLG, even even if it was like an online circuit, died there. Where Unreal shined was in the community organized competitive matches on the PC for which Fantasy eventually became a more than notable figure, despite his troubles in adapting to the mouse and keyboard input method. So to me, it sounds like you've, you've always been in the organizing scene uh, in some, some way since console. You hopped over to UT4 right away. How did you get so ingrained in the center of UT4? Because the way I look at it, you're one of the more iconic guys around here. Obviously, you're one of the heads of UT Pugs. How did, how did that all come to be? Uh, well, it almost did it. <laughs> so, so when I made my uh, I made my game computer specifically for Unreal Tournament 4, I had to obviously switch per peripherals, right? So um, obviously I was used to a controller. And, you know, initially uh, I was like, maybe I can, you know, move with a controller and aim with a mouse. I rolled that out. And so eventually, you know, I ended up buying a keypad. It was like a Logitech, was it G something? Anyway, it was like a Logitech keypad. And I, and I was terrible. And so uh, I almost quit because I was like, man, I can't, you know, back then I was saying, I can't adapt to keyboard and mouse. You know, long story short, obviously I have, but I, I was literally like a few games away from quitting because I was just getting uh, demolished. It's almost like, you know, I don't want to compare it to like a tra traumatic injury, but it's like almost like learning how to walk again, right? Like I have all this head knowledge of playing Unreal Tournament, you know, for like seven, six, six, seven years. And here I am trying to redo it again. It's like I said, it's just trying to walk again using a different input method. 
even though Unreal Tournament wasn't the most popular shooter on the market, competitive tournaments were held over ESL, and Fantasy would host his own dual tournaments with cash prizes. The easiest tournaments to organize are 1v1 tournaments. Number one, because I'm a dueler myself. I kind of have like my, my ear to the ground, you know, my finger on the pulse. I, like I duel all the time, so I kind of understand what to expect. You know, I, I won't necessarily be the best person to host like an assault tournament. If you ask me to host a 1v1 tournament, no problem. And so I've been hosting 1v1 tournaments for UT4 since the days of ESL. So before this game was kind of, you know, quote unquote canceled, ESL used to run tournaments for UT4. When ESL tournaments weren't going on, I would host like a, a random, like, hey guys, let's have a Monday night tournament. And so we would do like random eight man tournaments, random 60 man tournaments. We'd host it on challenge.com and just kind of go from there, right? And so that's kind of how I got started. Uh, ever since then, and then later on into the into the game, I'd say around 2018, we started getting some community members that were interested in like donating to bigger cash fight, you know, cash pools for tournaments. And so we started hosting those on Chalons.com. You know, we'd get streamers, you know, try to make it look as professional as possible with a, a crew of volunteers. But you know, I would just host more and more dual tournaments. And so you know, we'd have you know your regular free for all dual tournament where anybody can enter, or we'd have a dual tournament that we would call like a tier two tournament where like anyone that's placed top five or top eight in the regular tournament couldn't enter. And that way you kind of encourage new talent to kind of, you know, participate, right? And so that's that kind of worked out. <laughs> Despite all the ambiguity in the world, the community somehow prevailed. The game being abandonware did not make the Unreal Tournament editor any less effective for modding either. And it also did not stop the community from hosting their own servers and even tournaments. Beyond the tournaments, however, the players got more and more crafty too, developing various kinds of modifications, like mutators for instance, to enhance the player experience, which is something that not only is true for Unreal Tournament 4, but for the wider Unreal community at large. To remember is that you know Unreal Tournament is, is, has always been a platform, right? As much as it's a game, it's also a platform. So you have people who are making, would make crazy mutators to adjust all of this stuff, right? And I'm reminded of this by going back and playing Unreal Tournament 2004, where right out of the box, there's four or five mutators that are like, play it like it's Unreal Tournament 2003, play it like it's Unreal Tournament 99. <laughs> like, you know, they, they change the movement, they change the weapon functionality. So, you know, again, it's unfortunately, it's a, it's a life we'll never see, but it could have had a life where further mutators, options and adjustments based on, on a server by server basis could have basically made it a platform, the ultimate platform for playing Unreal Tournament. You look at all the different things that the community has brought in that are not part of the original game, such as our stats database. Um, so at any point in time when I'm playing the game, I can bring up an analysis of everything. I, how many jumps I did, how many moves I did, what weapon I used, what the accuracies were for that weapon. And then I can even extrapolate that out based on my opponent. So how do I play against this guy? And so you can analyze that. And then the replay system that was built into the game was phenomenal. It was actually gonna be like an eSports replay system. You had different camera angles, different information you could you could do, and you could watch yourself back. I would say as like for the community, the thing I'm most proud of would probably be ut4stats.com. Obviously I couldn't have done that by myself. There was a developer out in France, I wanna say, whose name is Chitui. He also created the Bunny Tracks game mod. Anyhow, that's Chitui made a plugin that allowed us to do um, web transactions basically well in the Unreal Tournament Editor because we have an old version of the Unreal Tournament Editor uh, because when development stopped we were left on like what 4.15 so anyhow using that plugin that Chitui created I ended up making a, a mutator that allowed you know hubs and servers to kind of send stats to a centralized database and so now I mean I, well, I made that one in 2018 or 2019 I'd have to check but, you know, it's collected over half a million games since then. And so that's one of the things I'd say I'd be most proud of in terms of like what I've contributed to the community. And a lot of people had some issues with the visual design, you know, of some of these, the weapons and things in the game. Um, what many people may not notice because they don't dive into the settings is that in the weapon settings, they actually have a weapon skins button that just never was used. You know, and it, maybe it's possible to sort of involve some kind of microtransaction. Maybe that would have kept it, I don't know. But you can imagine a world where if you don't like the way that the big red rocket launcher looks in Unreal Tournament, or you could, you know, have a model that looks like the UT2004 triple barrel. 
or a version that's sort of like it looks a bit like the Unreal Tournament 99 rocket launcher, maybe the old uh, eight ball with the six barrels from um, Unreal Gold, you know? Like there's a great opportunity to have all these different customizations in there to really make it an experience everyone would want, allow them to balance it how they see fit. Uh, I also created a mutator known as UT Plus, which is just kind of like a game balance mutator. You know, that has its fans and it has its people that prefer other modes, but you know, that's another thing I'm proud of in the sense that some of the uh, customization I allow for the game, you know, you can change the color of your shot cores, change the color of your shot combos, change the color of your link gun. You know, at one point, you know, I was allowed players to kind of like reskin their sniper rifle and have a lightning rifle instead. So things like that, those are things I'm proud of because, you know, when I stepped onto the to the scene, I had never touched Unreal Engine. I had never touched an Unreal Tournament editor. So this is, you know, through trial and error, I was able to kind of learn that and just contribute as much as I could kind of thing. Mutators were also prominently used to counteract the less popular alterations Epic have committed to. Like for instance, disabling the ability to turn view models off entirely, which for the most competitive of players was a significant problem. One thing some players wanted to get rid of was the dependency on the Epic Games launcher. And someone even managed to eventually circumvent the need for that launcher completely. Timimit developed UT4UU, or Unreal Tournament 4, unofficial update, which brought various quality of life improvements to the game and a few additional features. The catalyst for this mod idea was when Timimit's friend, who he played bunny track maps with, wondered if a player could bind more than just two taunts to their keyboard, which inspired him to start work on something. At first, UT4UU was supposed to be strictly for quality of life changes, but eventually it mutated into a more complex modification, which significantly changed the game in favor for pro players who had specific needs which a casual player didn't, especially the want for a more minimalistic and readable experience. What would be a great utility for almost every player out there, however, would be the unlocking of various items that became unobtainable. UT4UU got you covered. UT4UU initially was just a game hack, but after gaining access to the source code and managing to compile modifications, Timimit set out to rewrite the hack into a plugin, which would expand its usefulness even further, giving players the ability to even modify UI elements, which was previously deemed implausible to attain, and he even had the ability to fix the broken friend list the game had since 2021. When the bad news hit, Tim Emmett was just working on UT4UU and his studies, but quickly shifted to developing a master server replacement in order to ensure that Unreal Tournament 4 remained playable. When he first heard of the news, he was initially confused and pondered on the viability of the master server replacement, and if players were really willing to use an alternative method of logging in. But eventually he decided to start development. Developing the master server took some time and help from various contributors, and despite there being some challenges on the way, developing the server was a bit easier than expected, and also in part due to the availability of the game's source code. The full interview with Timimit that goes into the technical nitty-gritty can be downloaded as a PDF in the description below. If you want to support this master server project, there's one way to directly help out. Download Unreal Tournament 4, create an account at ut4.timimit.com and begin playing Unreal Tournament. Downloads are all provided in the description below. Asking people to start playing a game that was abandoned by its developers might seem like a huge ask. But then looking at player statistics and just how server hosting works in this game, you might reconsider this presumption fast. While the quick play mode doesn't exist anymore, at least at this moment it doesn't, multiple hub servers exist which any player can make use of. A hub isn't just a normal dedicated server in which a single game takes place, it rather is an environment that can host a multitude of games created by different people. These hubs can have plenty of modifications installed and a variety of maps, allowing a player to experience different game modes with different modifications, which may or may not change how the game is played. Don't like the rocket launcher missing its grenade function? On one hub I played, this feature was reintroduced. Sometimes weapons can also look or be animated differently, or even have modified attributes. Players host a wide range of games, some more competitive than others. 
If you really want to test your skills, join an elimination lobby. Elimination is a team-based deathmatch mode in which every player only gets one life, and is one of the most demanding modes out there. The same could be said about Duel, in which two players duke it out one versus one. In case you're wondering, the new Master Server actually supports a friend list feature, so players can add each other, no problem. Another team-based mode I always was quite fond of is Blitz, or Mega Blitz, an attack versus defense game mode in which one team has to deliver their flag to the enemy base. This mode really brings out the eSport potential Unreal Tournament 4 possesses, as it not only is about deathmatching, but also about strategy to some extent. The defenders have limited lives, and the odds are stacked in the attacker's favor. The goal for the defenders isn't necessarily to completely stop the attackers from ever delivering their flag to the base. The mode is rather centered around making the attacker's lives miserable by retarding the flag delivery as much as possible, as the attacker and defender roles will be reversed every round. The scoring is also rather unique for this game mode. Instead of relying on playing whole number of points per match won, the game rather awards a team a set number of stars based on how quickly the flag was delivered. A team can earn up to 3 stars if delivering the flag fast enough, and the remaining time is added on top of the score as a bonus. A competition can be won in just a few rounds if it is a stomp, or it can result in a war of attrition if the teams are somewhat equally skilled. This is an exciting mode you really should give a try. But what if you want to have a more casual experience? Personally, I always come back to Classic Deathmatch. One map, a bunch of players, and a deadly arsenal scattered throughout. All you need for some good hours of fun. And better yet, there are no teams, so every man or woman fights for themselves. One thing I have come to notice, however, is that Captain the Flag is seldom played. But don't you worry, you can just host the match yourself. While you may not own your own dedicated server, hubs allow you to create games that other players can join, and creating a lobby really is as easy as 1, 2, 3. Bots or no bots, CTF or Blitz, Instajib or not, the choice is yours, and other interested people will follow. So really, there is no reason why you shouldn't give Unreal Tournament a try. Knowing what hubs are and how they work now is great but you may also want to know who hosts them. The hubs have been created and are maintained by the most dedicated players in the community, and there's quite a selection. Unreal Battles, Unreal Pugs, Phoenix Germany, Unreal Carnage, and more, Unreal is and always was powered by the players. These hubs also existed before the game was shut down, but the entire community was able to migrate to Timimit's master server alternative. I have been playing on a multitude of hubs, and even though I am a European player, Unreal Carnage has cemented itself as a clear favorite for me, as many killer deathmatch games take place there. On the European hubs, you can never go wrong with some Blitz, and Elimination is often played by both the American and European scenes. Every hub also has community Discord servers one can freely join, and while the community is filled with players who most definitely are more experienced than you, don't be afraid to come by and say hi. If you want to play, check the description. You can download Unreal Tournament right now and begin playing. Also, feel free to represent that game review by setting a DGR clan tag. Hope to see you in the game. But what happens now? Not only Unreal Tournament 4, but rather the entire series is facing an existential nightmare. The games are unlisted, and if you own them, online play is made more difficult, and while many express their discontent over the burial of Unreal, not many actually step up to the task of playing the games to keep them alive for longer. One thing that many viewers have previously pointed out is that the title of this series, Dead Game Review, is oxymoronic or even completely inaccurate which for most of the games covered so far, is a correct assessment. While the title of the series may be provocative, its purpose is to inspire more interest in the players for games that they would have deemed not worth getting into. Past shutdown, I was able to play Unreal Tournament 4 any day I wanted to, 
and don't forget that the older games in the series are still playable, and most of them are still playable online, to varying degrees. What Epic have created with the shutdown of Unreal as a franchise is a collection of zombies. Games that have been buried, which just refuse to die. Unreal still is in trouble. It is harder to attract new players, especially in some of the older Unreal titles, like 2004, which doesn't even have functioning server browsers anymore. So random players join far less frequently. We have to be real. Unreal is stagnating. But I believe that we can resist that stagnation. Unreal Tournament will always represent the apex of competition. It not only represents endeavors to achieve victory, it also inspires self-reflection and a will to improve oneself. There have been times on the battlefield where I have bumped into other players, so to speak, in a way that I came across very not holistic. Um, uh, not honoring of who they are. Um, and so being a, a very team-based game, and I, right now I'm referring to the 5v5 uh, capture the flag mode, where we will log on, there's 10 people in the server, and both teams are trying to accomplish the goal of capturing the opponent's flag. To do that, you end up interacting with these gentlemen, and you find out a lot about yourself through that context of social interaction. There may be a social stigma out there that says, oh, the video gamer just sits in his mom's basement, he's alone down there, he's just basically having no life. But I would argue that video gamers are some of the most social people you're going to encounter. It's just that our social interactions occur mainly on and around Unreal Tournament. And so one thing that really changed me uh, was I had this very violent streak. One of my really good friends on the video game, someone that I look up to, someone that is top two in the world in his particular role in this video game, he, one night, I can still remember it, man, because everyone else had written me off at this point. I had a, I had a meltdown in, in the middle of a tournament and uh, he didn't write me off. He reached out to me in kindness and he DM'd me, which led to a call that lasted no more than 10 minutes. But it was what he said to me on that call that made me realize that he does want me here and that he does care for me and that it's I, I that I've got to lay down my sword, so to speak, and 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 realize that we're all in the in the battle together. What's really interesting is from that very day that that occurred. I have not had any extreme outbursts like I had before that day. Um, and so before that day, I was, um, <laughs> I would often get clipped on stream of doing outrageous things and, and saying outrageous things, uh, but not after. And it's because I realized that I belong here and that it's okay. I don't need to you know, I don't need to be toxic, I can, I can just enjoy the game. Unreal Tournament also became a tool that lends itself to people's refinement of one's artistic and technical prowess. Having touched the hearts of bedroom producers, fledgling level designers, CG artists and programmers all around the globe. Yeah, UT3 came out. I had very little interest in it. It's aesthetic, it aesthetically didn't appeal to me. Um, and. Uh, the, I found like the, the, the editor at the time was I found hard to use for one reason or another. Um, again, I, I had now muddied my sort of area of expertise by I was playing around in the Doom 3 engine. I was playing around in the Sage uh, engine. I was playing around in Source. I was even dabbling with Unity. Like I was doing all kinds of different stuff. So my 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 patience for relearning another engine again sort of waned. Um, uh, but then I got into university, Unreal Tournament 4 was announced alongside Unreal Engine 4 when it was a subscription and I was like, this looks fun and cool and uh, Unreal Engine 4 looks like user friendly, which is funny by today's standards because if you look at the interface, it looks dated as hell. But uh, I was like, oh great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on this bandwagon, um, you know, now that I have the, the skills and I'm in school for this, I'm in school for media and design, you know, so this will be the thing that I can do. One of the things that I loved about Unreal Tournament when I started finally figuring out the Unreal Tournament editor 
is that one of the things that I always liked, you know, like I played Quake Champions when it released. I think it, Quake Champions came out in 2017, like right when UT4 development was paused. But when Quake Champions came out, you know, they had weapon skins, right? And so I was like, man, I like weapon skins. So I ended up making, at the time, uh, a weapon skins mutator. And it wasn't my greatest work. And I was still learning the editor, you know, but over time I kind of like iterated it over it. And like the latest version I haven't touched in so long, but it's, trust me when I say it's a lot better than the initial version. But just things like that, like I saw a need, like if I'm playing another game and I say, hey, I wish I had this skin, like that's too bad. Like I either pay for it or I wait for them, you know, like I pay for it, I earn it somehow. But like with this game, like, you know, with Unreal Tournament, you know, you could just make a mutator and say, I wanted this. All right, now I have it. And not to forget, Unreal Tournament means community bringing with it the many grudges and rivalries, long-lasting friendships, year-long personal competitions to become the best there ever was, artistic collaborations, and even projects such as the one you're watching right now. Huge thanks to Kurgan for taking the time to interview subjects, connecting me with people and the Unreal community at large, and offering support all throughout this production. Thank you, Nick, for sharing your personal history with Unreal with me and the world. Your love letter to Unreal Video acted like a catalyst to this production, and it certainly wouldn't have happened the way it did without your involvement. To me, admit, I am certainly 100% speaking for the entire community for this one. Thank you so much for sacrificing so much of your time and resources to ensure that everyone gets to enjoy Unreal Tournament 4 past shutdown, and for having taken the time to chat about your work on the Master Server replacement. And finally, I want to extend my gratitude to Fantasy and Exit Next Ride for giving me tons of insight for this production and for allowing me to use clips from your interviews and also gameplay videos. Too bad I could not be present during your interviews with Kurgan, but I hope to encounter you guys in game soon enough, even though that would be a definite death sentence for me. In the end, Unreal is not quite dead yet, and I believe that this project is only further evidence of that. Unreal only dies if a player base does. And the guys who are still playing past shutdown don't seem to be willing to hang up their shock rifles just yet. Download Unreal Tournament now and join the fight. It costs you nothing, and you may just end up loving it. Now it is 2341. Fifty years have passed since the founding of Deathmatch. Profits from the tournament number in the hundreds of billions. You have been selected to fight in the professional league by the Leandro Rules Board. Your strength and brutality are legendary. The time has come to prove you are the best. To crush your enemies. To win the tournament.